everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Happy New Year. Hands. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the IPFS um, weekly call, the first one in 2019. I'm glad to see everyone here. We will begin, let's see. So if you're in this call, if you could just put your name in the um, attendee section of our um, call document, that'd be great. And I'm putting that in a chat right now. So if you're part of the call, you put your name in, that'd be great. Um, and we will begin this call with um, announcements from David. Then we'll get into our main presentation from Rudiger, and we will end our call with questions and answers, and you can put your questions in the chat. And that will be our call today. So without further ado, let us start with David. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so I have like four little things. Uh, it's basically homework for everyone to check out. Uh, and so, the first one uh, is that I try to paint a picture of what our planning is. Uh, so we have roadmaps, we have OKRs, we have Kanban boards, we have all sorts of things. Uh, and so I try to, okay, like if I were to kind of like distill this down and like understand like where do we touch each of these things, like when do we apply them, when do we use them? And I try to make like this one slide uh, it doesn't have very fancy graphics. Uh, it is just something I did with Keynote, but I hope it's helpful. At least it was helpful to me to guide other people through, hey, like we have road mapping and this is a highly yearly planning thing. We have OKRs and this is a quarterly planning and this is how we track progress. Um, or this is where our dev meetings or our hack weeks come into play. I like do increase the shared understanding of the group uh, and, and I tackle new, new ideas or new problems. And then we have things that we help us like synchronize every week, like the sync times, the calls, like this one, the Kanban boards and so on. And so uh, like, please share your feedback. Tell me if this is helpful, especially for people that are new to this community, that are new to the project. Uh, I know there's a lot of details. Um, we have been taking a lot of, like we've been investing a lot of time upgrading the team management repo to also make sure that the onboarding is simpler. So that's the first one. Please review that PR that I just posted here on Zoom that is also posted on notes. The, the second thing is that I want to, it's a proposal. Uh, it's basically uh, making the maintainer protocol org wide. So the maintainer protocol was something that was born within the JavaScript ecosystem of the IPFS project. Uh, it is something that basically recognizes my contribution uh, and, and, and like, like amazing contributions from the community and kind of like helps everyone move faster by, by giving more autonomy. And so instead of having the benevolent dictator, having the merge access for every single repo and like having the publish access and making everyone wait, it's more about like describing what is the expected responsibility of a maintainer uh, and, and then like inviting people to take the responsibility for certain repos. It's kind of like it's a way to distribute knowledge to like help everyone feel more ownership of the project. So that, that kind of like helps the JavaScript project move faster. And, and I think we can upgrade this to make it org wide to help the other code projects, but not only. Like we can have a maintainer for the specs repo, like someone that can like label the issues or at least give some feedback to people that ask questions there or someone to the docs repo at the website, et cetera. Like someone that not only uh, is responsible to like give some uh, feedback, but also like that can groom the issue, that can label it, that can be the first person re replying to a new question. So that's like there is uh, more engagement. Uh, and so please review that PR. Um, and then the next one is also available. Uh, and so this is basically like a spree of like new ideas to help us coordinate together. Um, and so the next one is about repo badges. I love you know Remy badges in case you haven't noticed, uh, and so I think they are helpful. And right now, uh, we went from 2000 late 2017 where there were no working groups to uh, late 2018 where we have a working group process and like working groups established with their own OKRs and their own teams and so on. But now we have like more like 544 repos across five organizations, and and sometimes it's hard. Who owns this repo? Who is responsible to make sure like it's not, uh, it shouldn't be archived? Or uh, who do I ask questions about the code that is living here? Um, and sometimes like that is kind of like fuzzy. 
uh, there are projects that move from one working group to another working group because they get bootstrapped in one working group and then like, it makes more sense to other working group to take it over. So I think that badges are a good idea. Like you put a badge at the top of the Remy, like you know who it belongs. So the working group can then um, like check in and see the projects that they are tackling. Uh, yeah, I'll comment on that PR as well. And last but not the least, uh, <laughs> the infamous, uh, please check your OKRs uh, requests. Um, uh, there, there are uh, 10 open pull requests uh, and I guess like, uh, well, everyone just came back from holidays. So uh, people need some time to just pay in on all the discussions that they have before holidays. But like, please do as soon as possible. Uh, a, a humble goal is can we shoot to have this merge by the end of this week? Like the, the, the version that we commit to this quarter so that we all have a shared understanding of like what each working group is going to focus. Uh, it is also an excellent opportunity for the community to kind of page in of like what are going to be our primary priorities um, for this quarter and give us feedback. Maybe we are missing something or there is something that you will be very excited that you don't know yet. So, okay. <laughs> I try to compress this as much as possible. Uh, there, all the PRs are open. Feedback is accepted. If you have any questions now, I'm happy to answer. Um, maybe I'll raise your hand. Yeah, let's uh, have about three minutes or so for questions, and you can put your questions in the chat. Oh, I see Matt has a hand. Matt, yeah. Uh, I can add this as a comment on the on the PR also, but with the lead maintainer protocol, when I so when I got involved in this project, I was coming from a space where that kind of approach was the default. When I pushed for that in 2016, I was told that we that that's dangerous because of the type of software we're building, that we have to be more careful about um, controlling who has merge ability uh, on the repos. And people pointed to things like the Linux kernel as a reference of projects that are still open source but don't have that wide open notion of who can who can function as a maintainer and how people become a maintainer um, so d do you have any thoughts on that like has that changed is it that this what you're proposing only applies to some repos and not others um, and possibly your latest proposal addresses this I haven't read the latest version got it uh, it's definitely like, like a, a common concern in open source projects and that's why like, there's different strategies for different projects uh, the maintainer protocol the lean maintainer protocol kind of like tries to cover for that because in the end it's not some it's not like a land land grabbing moment where like someone can just arrive and say now I'm the maintainer for this repo it's kind of like a, a a ritual process where someone by contributing to the project by like basically gaining trust with the other contributors can then be nominated uh, invited to become the maintainer of that repo. That said, uh, we actually like still keep the tech leads to be the real, like the people that release the top level projects. So go IPFS, just IPFS, just like peer, peer Like th there is some more uh, kind of like proven work to be able to release the thing that I can then everyone installs. Uh, we, we are a little bit more flexible with the internal pieces, the building blocks that, that make these like implementations. Um, and, and so there's also like a, always a, a, a dual, like a couple, um, like maintaining the repos. It is always a, um, an adventure between uh, the maintainer of the repo, everyone that in the working group that is contributing to that repo as well, and the tech lead for that side of the project. Um, and so the, the, there is like the actually not duo, it's a more of like a, a, a trio um, a, in which like people kind of like just help each other, make sure that they're making the right decisions, reviewing the PRs in uh, uh, a correct way, that the right things are getting merged, that they are making, like that the new maintainers actually get to the opportunity to learn all the context from previous decisions. So when we implemented this in the JS ecosystem, there, like a big part of my role, like uh, doing that transition was just pointing people to issues where we had discussions saying, this is not a great idea right now because we have considered these situations. And so uh, as a human index of all IPFS knowledge, I was like, just like pointing people to like, just like gather, get that context as well as I had it in my, my head. Uh, over time, it, it's something that kind of like spreads, gossips over, and, and like more people become more informed and more confident to make more decisions. Um, but, but, but still, it, it is like a, a, a good concern to have and, and something to remind ourselves to make sure to perhaps like every quarter 
just do a round of my check-ins, like let's see uh, who has permissions to do what, uh, who has permissions to do merges, to do releases, etc. And if we still feel confident that like that setup, that current uh, structure is the right one or not. So I see a hand from Steven and a hand from Molly in chat. Go, go uh, ahead, sorry. Steven. I wanted to point out that the Linux kernel actually has a maintainer protocol as well, uh, where each module has like a maintainer's file that says who maintains it. And Linux will like do a git pull from their repos to merge and changes. But I think he, like, he, can, he still has the final control, but uh, he doesn't necessarily go everything with a fine tooth comb. Uh, and it's effectively what we have with the GoFS, where like, uh, we, um, if we, even if we have separate maintainers for individual repos, we still control, like your one person still controls uh, when those changes actually get brought into GoFS itself. I think my point's very similar to Steven's, which is just, um, I, I like the idea of lead maintainer protocol. I like that it um, kind of diffuses responsibility for different areas, and I think it's more accurate for actually the way that we develop on a lot of these different things. There are experts on this throughout the community um, for different areas of the code base, and one individual is not the expert for an entire uh, implementation of IPFS in a certain language. Um, however, I do think that there's layers of feedback that happen throughout, and um, for example, someone who might be the expert on one module might not be the person who um, is setting long-term strategic direction for where that module heads, and it's a kind of a, um, we do still have these kind of maintain, like lead maintainer roles. So like um, we have like lead maintainer for GoIPFS that might provide feedback to many different module maintainers. And then we might have lead maintainer for IPFS that might provide feedback to many different captains across JS and Go and other communities. And I think that's something that um, we should just continue to, to support and make sure we use it. Um, and that as long as this doesn't agree, disagree with that, I'm 100% on board. I'll just I'll throw in the rest of my comments in the in the PR thing. I'll just point out that Steven said this is what we already have in Go IPFS. So David's proposal is proposing to change that. So, uh, so if if David's proposing that we should take this protocol and apply it across the rest of the org, is it a protocol that's already in place in Go IPFS or not? So they're like I'm confused on what's changing and what's staying the same. Then, sorry, um, the, the, this was what we have in Go IPFS is the. Uh, technically controlling what goes in and out of GoIPFS itself, the main repo, not the rest of the lead maintainer protocol. Currently in GoIPFS, uh, pretty much anyone with right access can merge things uh, to other repos, except for the GoIPFS main one. I think this one would basically delegate control specifically to say this person is responsible for this repo, this person is responsible for this repo, et cetera. I believe in JavaScript, there's one person, I don't know, but I think there's one person responsible for the main repo, uh, but I just yeah. don't know. So, uh, uh, as, like, as a, I guess, like a good clarification is really to like just go through the the protocol itself, so that everyone pages in uh, on what is described there. But, but like, to as a point of clarification for the whole group, uh, there is definitely a distinction between the maintainer of the repo, and so the person that can review the pull requests, that can give advice, that can label the issue, that can, given that like all of the criteria were met for the pull request, can merge and therefore then release that code. And then there is other people uh, in the project that kind of like spread their responsibility with a bit across multiple areas of their expertise that are uh, this, like typically titled the tech leads of the project that actually have more a clear understanding of like what is the strategic trajectory that the project is taking. Um, and so the maintainer protocol is not kind of like trying to silo people into being responsible for the whole strategy of a single repo. Uh, it is more like distributing the responsibility, the ownership of the multiple pieces of the database and giving people autonomy um, to, to be able to like merge code, uh, review, or review, give feedback, merge code. And, and like the, the end result is that you get a, a code base and like a, a repo base that is way more uh, curated, way more groomed, that way that contributors get uh, responses way faster because that there is more people to whom ask questions. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess like uh, there's like some things that like GoIPFS is already doing that are described here. They are just not explicitly declared for GoIPFS land. Um, in, in what this protocol like proposes is just like making it explicit so that like newcomers can understand what it means. But but yeah, like I, I <laughs> my apologies, Portia, we are taking too much time. Uh, so I'll shut, <laughs> shut off now and I'll let you go. <laughs> 
Uh, I believe you are muted. If you are speaking, you are speaking. If anyone has any other conditional concerns or questions, you can leave the issue. You can leave an issue um, in the GitHub link in the chat. So without further ado, we will begin our main presentation. Uh, Rudiger is going to explain how he uses um, IPFS in, is your, is the name of your company Actics? Yes. Actics. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Take it away. All right. So, um, well, two words about me. I'm a kind of old guy. I've been doing software development since professionally, so paid money since two, uh, 1999. And I've got uh, 10 years experience in the space industry. And in 2016, I was kind of uh, convinced by a good friend of mine, uh, Roland Kuhn, who is the CTO of Actix, to join Actix. And uh, now I'm going to share my screen and uh, talk a little bit about what we do with IPFS at Actix and what we do in general also. And I hope it will be interesting for you. So, can you see this? We can. Okay. Okay, so first of, first of all, a few words about Actix. Um, so Actix is a startup um, founded in 2016. Uh, there's three founders, two are mechanical engineers. One is a software engineer and physicist. And uh, so we have some domain knowledge in both manufacturing and software. Uh, we are based in Munich, Central Europe, but uh, just as Protocol Labs, we are a fully distributed engineering team. Uh, but <clears throat> since we are at a very early stage, we um, confine ourselves to the European time zones. So we got people in Madrid uh, and in Sofia, that, that's the extent of it, but we wouldn't hire somebody in the US or in New Zealand, unfortunately. Um, so what we do, um, a very high level overview of what we do is we are doing digitalization of manufacturing processes. Um, so uh, we have a very clear focus on the shop floor. So what we, what we want to do, we don't want to replace anything in the, in the front office like an ERP or any uh, customer relationship, whatever. We're only interested in things that happen on the shop floor. So directly related to manufacturing. Um, and that's a very big area in, in Germany and in Central Europe. Um, so one thing that, that always comes up when, when we talk about what we do is, oh, they're doing robots. And actually, that's not what we do. That's not, not, not the core of it. What we do is not primarily about automation. Um, so what we do, basically, we want to have a way to coordinate all the things that happen in the factory whether it's a robot that's, uh, that's doing something or a worker or some kind of logistics that's happening, any process ha that happens in a factory at a high level is something we are interested in to, to um, automate or to, to uh, faci facilitate. And um, well, you could say, I mean, obviously there are some cases where automation is very useful. I mean, if you have a place with, which stamps metal pieces, you don't want a human to do that. But there are lots of lots of situations where humans are quite quite um, competitive, and so what we want to do, kind of a mission statement, is we want to use digital technology to keep human labor competitive with automation. So it's not just about automating everything, but basically make sure that uh, humans are as efficient as they can be in the factory. And I got a quote for this from Elon Musk: uh, "Yes, excessive automation at Tesla was a mistake." Uh, to be precise, my mistake, uh, humans are underrated. And that's something we can really get behind uh, at Actix. Okay, so that's a big picture view. Um, so far we have basically been development, uh, developing applications for various customers in Europe. And this year we're going to get a little bit more open about something where um, kind of a long-term vision, uh, which is Actix OS which is essentially an operating system for factories. And it's a very long topic. I could talk about this for 15 minutes or 20 or, but the, the basic idea is we want to allow people that have manufacturing domain knowledge. So they know how manufacturing works, but they don't 
have distributed systems knowledge. There's quite a few of those people. And we want these people to uh, enable these people to write um, resilient applications for manufacturing. So we want to enable them to be able to write applications which are partition tolerant, so they work when there's some kind of network error in the factory, and they are distributed, so there's no single point of failure. And that's, that's the basic idea of Actix OS. Okay, so um, just before I go into details how exactly we use IPFS, I just wanted to show a few pictures from our customers. So this is a glass manufacturing plant. These bottles that you can see there are basically, they're glowing red because they have been, have been uh, just produced out of a blob of molten glass. And um, this is an industrial tablet, an industrial Android tablet, uh, which is used by the worker to coordinate what's happening here. Uh, so for example, if there's some kind of error in one of the machines, you can lock the error here and so on. And this is um, running the Actix OS and Actix applications. And it's also running IPFS, obviously, because we are using IPFS kind of as our networking stack, so to speak. <coughs> this is another application. This is a um, public transport maintenance facility. So in, in Frankfurt, Germany, there is a facility that performs regular maintenance on um, subway trains. And in order to coordinate what needs to be done uh, for this regular maintenance, there's basically a list of things they have to do. And then there's another list of things that they do based on need. So if something's broken, they fix it. And to coordinate this, here also we have the Android tablet, which is attached to this thing, which is called the shop floor board. And there we have the Actix application running. Um, so this is a close up view of the thing. As you can see, this is a very, very uh, normal Android tablet, but it's um, well, from a software point of view, but it's a little bit more expensive and it's, um, and it's rugged. So it's watertight and you can drop it from two meters on concrete without breaking, which is very helpful in the factory. So it's way more robust than my MacBook Pro. Um, and as you can see, this is running an application which allows you to track progress on some production step. And you can lock how many things you have produced. And you can say, now I'm finished with the activity. This is something called production data acquisition. And uh, I'll go into detail about that a little bit later. Um, this is another application. In this case, uh, this is in a, in a machine, in a manufacturing machine. There are these uh, Dean rails where, where all the equipment is that, that powers the machine. And in addition to all the usual equipment in this machine, there is this, uh, this gray box. It's an industrial Raspberry Pi. So it has a very fancy name, but essentially it's a Raspberry Pi with a more rugged um, case. And this is also running the Actix platform, so it's also running uh, Go IPFS. And this, obviously, this kind of machine can only be used for very low data rates, so some kind of counters. It cannot be used for machine learning, but if you just want to get some data, then this is, this is the way to go. They are not that expensive, and they are very rugged, and you just put them into, um, into these Dean rails and connect them to the machine. Um, so I, I said that we are, uh, what we want to do is we want to replace paper in manufacturing. And just, just to give you an idea what exactly uh, is meant by that, uh, this is a, um, product, a manual production data acquisition form, which is filled out by the workers. So every time they do something, every time, uh, every time they produce something, they have to fill out these forms. And this is something we can replace with our application. And if you look at this, you think, oh, this looks very 80s. But actually, that's not at all the case. If you go into even, even very reasonably modern factories, you will see that the front office is very modern. But once you go into, onto the shop floor, you'll always see these paper-based production, production orders. Not in all factories, but in a very, very uh, large uh, fraction of the small to medium-sized factories, you still have this. And it's not, not all bad because, you know, one thing about paper is that it always works. So you don't need a cloud connection to write something on this piece of paper. And that's why people are not, are a little bit hesitant to replace paper. And in order to convince people to, uh, to replace paper by something uh, digital, 
it has to be really robust. So this is the last slide of, of this part. So this is all the places where we have active solutions deployed and they're all running IPFS. So these are a bunch of factories in, in Central Europe where uh, we have our, um, our software deployed and we have also IPFS deployed. Mostly they are pretty small deployments. We're trying to grow them next year, but it's very nice to have these things actually in production. So we build them for this actually. <coughs> okay, so now I want to go a little bit into detail why exactly we have chosen IPFS. Um, so one thing, I, I was interested in content storage even before I learned about uh, IPFS. Um, well, Git uses it, so kind of everybody knows it since 2008 or whatever. And I think especially for manufacturing data, it's very nice to have this safety against data corruption because the data is kind of important. It might be that some, some batch of production is, um, is uh, deficient and then you have to prove that uh, you did everything uh, according to, uh, to the rules. And if you have content address storage, there's not much way to tamper with the data. So that's a very important property for us and also for our customers. Um, next thing is auditability. You can basically um, have an audit trail which, which you can uh, prove that a, at a certain time in a certain factory, uh, some things happened. And location transparency, I mean, I don't have to tell you that, but basically uh, you just ask for a hash, you get it, you don't care where exactly it is. Um, so partition tolerance is also very important for us. Like I mentioned, we want to replace paper. And one thing that's really great about paper is that it always works. You don't have to have the piece of paper connected to another piece of paper. Just take the piece of paper and a pen and that's it. And um, so if you want to replace paper, we have to, um, we have to build on something which is also resilient. And that's basically why we use uh, IPFS. Um, well, and yeah, partition tolerance is uh, very important for us basically. Um, so for what do we uh, use IPFS? So, um, so our, our core platform is essentially a distributed event sourcing system. And <clears throat> what we use IPFS for primarily is storage and distribution of events. So if you have one of these tablets and um, as soon as you do something on the, on the tablet, like you start a production order or you, you stop something, you report an error, an event gets created and we use IPFS to store the event and also to get it on the other devices which might be interested in the event. Um, next thing is deployment of large assets. So we have, um, for example, work instruction videos. If you have some kind of manual production uh, step, then often the uh, factories have videos which tell the workers exactly how this step is to be performed. And um, it's quite useful to, to be able to take a large number of videos and put them on lots of devices using IPFS. Um, but it doesn't work as good as, it, as it's supposed to work. We'll get to that later. But um, in principle, it's, it's a great way to distribute large assets. Uh, given that these factories often have a very, very uh, slow connection to the cloud. So imagine you have 20 devices and each of them wants to download the video. That would not be good. So we also use IPFS as infrastructure for app uh, development. So basically all our developers are all in a private swarm and they can interact with, uh, with each other and try the app in that. And we use it as an app artifact repository. It sounds fancy, but basically just a directory with, with uh, artifacts in it. Um, so what features do we use? Um, well, obviously we use content and rest storage. That's probably not noteworthy. But the next thing is a little bit more noteworthy. We use private swarms. Obviously, we don't want, we can't tell our customers you will be joined to the public IPFS swarm. So we use private swarms. Each customer has its own swarm. The developers have their own swarm and so on. And that's an experimental feature uh, as of now, as far as I know. We use PubSub, which is very important to get uh, events from different devices, which is also experimental at this time. And we use IPNS, but not that much anymore because we keep running into trouble with that. 
Um, we would love to use it again, but like sometimes we try to use it and then we have run into some problems and then we decide to do, do it in a different way. Um, okay, so devices that we support. Um, so first of all, we support Linux-based industrial PCs. Could be these tiny Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi machines, or it could be some huge machine learning rigs, but uh, basically um, it has to be Linux-based. Um, then we have these Android-based uh, industrial tablets, like the one I've shown. And we also have Android-based barcode scanners for logistics applications. So this, this is a barcode scanner. Basically, it's an Android tablet which has a laser which can um, scan barcodes. These things are actually quite neat. They can scan barcodes over a distance of 20 meters. So if you have a large warehouse, you can scan a barcode in, in, the, in the highest um, row. And last but not least, we also use Linux-based virtual machines. So the philosophy is always to get our node as close as possible to the data source or sync. So if the customer has an ERP, for example, on site, we put a virtual machine next to the ERP. So basically in the same rack. And if the customer has some, some cloud system, we also put a system in the uh, um, node of our system in the, in the same cloud, as close as possible, basically. So network, network topology uh, speaking. Okay, so this, let's uh, interrupt this a little bit and do a little demo. Um, will be hard to recognize, but I still think it's fun to see this. So this is um, one of these industrial Android tablets. And on that, you can see this is for a workstation, which is called hand cleaning. And there you have the different activities which, are, which can be performed at a workstation. And then the worker can basically tap on one activity. And then you can join the activity. So now basically, he would be working on that activity and the time that he's working on that activity would be locked. And then, well, there's all kinds of ways to interact with that, but I don't want to go into details. But one thing I want to show, um, we also have the ability there to, for each production step, we have a list of documents, which can be um, PDF files, which describe how something is to be done or also um, videos. The videos are most, most challenging from a um, data point of view, obviously. So, inside the app, we have the ability to um, play back some videos, which are like instructional videos, how to perform, perform these, these work steps. As you can see, he takes a, a proper protective clothing and all that stuff, basically. And these videos uh, come from IPFS running on this, on this device. OK, so I think it's pretty hard to see via the webcam. So, but I think you, you got an idea, right? So I'm going to oh. share again. Um, we are really good. Yeah. We are running um, low on time. So do you mind if we go into uh, questions and answers? Um, yes, I mean, just, just one slide, okay? Okay. So no this, this is basically uh, how we do it on the, on the Android devices. So we got a shell app and uh, a web view in which we got the, uh, our Actix apps. And um, these Actix apps, that's one thing that you might find confusing. Um, they talk to a Go IPFS process via REST API. So we don't use JS IPFS, and we also don't use JS IPFS API for various reasons, but we just use the REST API directly. We have Go IPFS running on this Android device. Okay, yeah, so questions? Awesome. Vaughn. Thank you very much. That was an amazing presentation. Yay, Woo. that was great. Thank you very much. Um, if you have a question, if you could put it in the chat, <coughs> that would be great. Han, okay, Molly. Hey, this is awesome. Um, I'm curious, 
whether or what you've experienced um, or how much um, interest there is from various factory clients around kind of a um, either a resiliency or an offline sort of perspective of being able to kind of run and host this content in a more distributed fashion. Um, curious from, from your perspective, having a lot of those conversations, what you've experienced um, in terms of their feedback and how much of a factor that is for them. Well, it is, uh, I mean, it very much depends. Some customers are not really aware of, of the, the problems with, with having a centralized application. Um, but they will definitely notice once it breaks. And you often have these situations where the factory kind of doesn't work because the ERP currently is broken because the ERP is a, in a different location. So once you explain to them that, that this would not happen, it's, it's actually uh, it's a good sell then. And then in other situations, you, you actually they, they immediately understand the benefit. For example, in, we have logistics applications. And they are basically, you have a scanner and you track material movements, and they often don't have good Wi Fi coverage in their warehouse. So they immediately understand that they need to be able to, to perform a movement without having Wi Fi coverage because it's impossible to get good Wi Fi coverage in a warehouse full of like metal barrels. So many people actually get it. So, so sometimes you have to help them a little bit to understand, but they, they get the benefit definitely. It's just the, the, the hard thing is that we need to have a programming model, which is easy enough that, um, that people don't have to be distributed systems experts to write this software because otherwise it won't work. I mean, these, these people are domain experts that really, really, really know about their domain, but they don't know about partition tolerance or cap theorem or CRDTs or any of that. And they shouldn't have to know, right? Totally, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Juan? Juan? Hector. Hector, I'm sorry. Hector? Hi, can you hear me? Barely. Now? Yes, that's better. Thanks. Um, are you using the P2P for custom protocols? or for logging into your devices remotely and so on? Um, well, this feature is quite kind of new. So currently we don't use it, but when it was released, we were immediately thinking about that, that we, there would be several ways we could use it. So we're thinking about it, let's put it that way. Um, okay, thank you. It's, it's very, very useful because uh, the, the, these companies often have a very restrictive firewall and any way to, to get around there would be very useful. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay, um, we can take one more question. Does anyone else have a question? <coughs> if not, we will end here. Um, one. I want to thank Rudiger. Thank you very much for presenting. This was amazing. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Two, if you have any additional questions um, after the presentation, you can leave them in the comments section. And three, next week, Terry will be presenting Proto School. Um, so, Proto School, it's not the launch is next week but if you want to experiment with proto school then please go ahead um it's really exciting and if you actually want to start a proto school meetup in your city uh please i'll look, leave those links in the comment section you can go and start a proto school um network in your city so thank you ev thank you everyone for attending the ipfs weekly meeting and i will see you next week take care bye, -bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>